Um, so last month was our first month on a new format. Um, it had worked in some ways. I think people had fun with it, and I saw a lot of bright ideas, um, a lot of good thinking going on. Unfortunately, we wound up driving by some of the good thinking and not being able to focus on it, and even trying to accelerate. Uh, we ran out of time about a third the way through what I'd actually, the arc I thought we'd complete. So it was like one of those novels where the author gets tired of writing and it just kind of, and then they lived happily ever after at the end. They're like, what? Um, uh, somebody came up to me afterwards and said, that was really fun. Did it have anything to do with Ruby? <laughs> um, and that's a problem that I think the format had that way. So I wanna, I'm going to turn it around this time. Instead of waiting to the end to ask you to do something, I'm going to ask you really early on. Um, and then we'll explain what it is you're doing after you're already trying to do it and see if that works better. Um, so as a first step, um, actually, how many people know about the Dunning-Kruger effect? Okay. I know about it, am I affected by it? Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so basic idea, because it looks like maybe a third of you do. Um, people are really bad at self-assessing their skills. People who don't know anything about a subject believe there's very little to know um, if you ask a kindergartner who knows how to add how much they know of mathematics, they'll say, almost, I, I've got addition and subtraction. It looks like it's a pretty straightforward extrapolation. They don't really say that, but you know, they think, I know a lot of math. You know, if you ask uh, you know, somebody working on their PhD in math how much of math they know, you know, it's vanishingly small because there's so much, I'll never learn it all. The more you know, the more you realize that you don't know, and so your estimation of your knowledge is inversely proportional to your knowledge, but not really, because people actually can tell if they suck at something or not. Um, so given that, to poison your minds, I'd like you to self-identify into three categories based on Ruby experience and some tainting of knowledge, but we don't have to do that. Um, if you don't know anything about Ruby, keep your hands down. If you consider yourself, yeah, I'm, I'm middle of the road Ruby, I'm you know, like a, a, a Ruby dev. If you think you're a senior Ruby dev, raise both hands. And then look around the room and try and adjust so that we've got a nice distribution. Okay, so if you look like nobody's got two hands up, then maybe uh, you should raise two hands. If everybody's got their hands, you can kind of adjust it. So start doing that. Start doing that. And then what I'd like to do is for uh, Windows, well actually for Unixy people, I want to do something kind of like uh, an F, uh, um, F disk, okay? Uh, for Windowsy people, I want to do a defrag, you know, of the hard drive. And for uh, Mac people, I guess what, you just buy a new Mac, right? <laughs> uh, so, but whatever you do when the disk gets too fragmented, start doing that to sort yourselves into groups where you're around people with different levels of experience. So right here I see two people with both hands up. Three. Okay, three people, three people with both hands up. You guys should split up. Okay, find somebody with one hand up or no hands up. People with no hands, find somebody with more hands. I mean, not, not that you have no hands, but no hands raised. Form yourselves up into groups. And then... What? Have you had this yarn before? Okay. Oh, oh I see. Okay. And then the other thing is, at each end of the table, I'm going to be putting um, <laughs> tactile aids. Nice. Oh. Those like those sour worm candies. Okay, so pass these down. You guys get more than that, actually. And pass things down. Back and down. Okay, do you guys want to consolidate or are you being antisocial down here or? Okay. Pass these things down. Okay, pass, you guys, take, take some tactile aids and pass them down. Is there a marker? 
for this. Oh, there we go. Let's see, am I, who's doing the videoing? What? On the videoing, and may I move this around or is that, was the assumption that I was going to leave it? Is that okay? Okay, so each team with uh, somebody who's pretty good and some people who are maybe a little bit not so good and some people who don't know what they're doing, um, which is all teams, um, is going to try and solve the problem. Okay, go. <laughs> um, oh, right. I should probably tell you what 42. the problem. <laughs> so, what the problem is. Okay. Um, do you guys want a cute story that kind of motivates the problem, or do you want it just in the abstract? Cute story. Cute story. Cute story. Okay. So, you guys work for a company that makes rubber bands, and some people have been telling you that the rubber bands are coming to them defective and they're all snarled up and they can't make heads or tail, they can't unsnarl them. No matter what they do, they can't untie it. Effectively, they're saying the rubber bands may be something like, let's see, how do I do? I think that, there we go. So, <coughs> trefoil knot, okay? Now, what actually though, your customer service people said, no, our customers are idiots. What they're actually getting is something like this, and if they just undo it, the rubber band is fine. So you've got a complaint resolution system where people email in JPEGs of the supposedly defective rubber band, and it gets processed into an image that shows crossings like this. Okay, this means this rubber band goes under this you know, point here. Okay, and they're going to take these in and they want to have a data structure in Ruby that's going to allow them to manipulate it. And some other team is working on a thing that's going to use your data structure and they're going to do what are called um, the Readmeister moves. Readmeister moves are given a twist like that, we can convert to or from something like that. We can flip it. Two, um, given something like this, where a rubber band or a loop crosses under one, we can convert it to something like that. And three, given a crossing where something passes behind it, we can convert to and from Um, actually, I need to clear that there. Same thing like that. Okay? All of those are things you could do without cutting the rubber band. And by doing some sequence of these moves, any snarl, you can untangle and show that the rubber band is good. But if it's a knotted, this won't be able to resolve it. Yeah? I'm pretty sure your third example just rotated 180 degrees. Can you clarify? Um, you right. None of these are doing anything magical, but the point is they're operating on a list of crossings, an a data structure, and these are the operations you need to do in order to transform this either into a good rubber band or fail to do so, in which case we say, yeah, refund them their money. Okay? So these operations are relatively trivial, correct? And so it should be no trouble whatsoever to come up with a Ruby data structure that in some form represents what's called a crossing diagram. Okay? So you need to be able to represent, goes under here, goes over here, how the connectivity of this is. And then the API for this data structure, for this class or whatever, you have to be able to specify a crossing and either reverse it or specify a rung and switch it and make a crossing. You have to be able to take a pair of crossings and either undo them, you know, do this transformation, or that. You don't have to write all the Ruby code. Okay? What I want you guys to do is brainstorm what shape this sort of thing is going to be. 
For instance, are you going to represent these things as strings and then you've got regular expressions that you know, G sub the right things to do it. Um, are you going to do it with uh, um, arrays and you're going to have inter integer indices to tell you how to do it? Are you going to do it with what? What would you do? Okay. Any what? Yeah. Okay. So, um, of the people who raised two hands, are there any of you who believe they have open questions that would prohibit you from discussing this with the people at your table and starting to work towards a solution? I'm not saying you know everything, but do you have any? Yeah. Yes. Why did I raise two hands? I, I don't that. know. <laughs> I would. <laughs> um, I just want to clarify. You can have any number of rubber bands in a picture. What? You can have, in, in, for a given photo, does the data structure represent a rubber band, ah. or does it represent a photo right. of ten rubber bands? It might actually be that what they had is two rubber bands tangled together. OK, in which case, yeah. Um, and it may be that some of the supposedly defective rubber bands are two perfectly good rubber bands that are linked but not knotted. OK, you don't have to care about that. All you have to do is come up with the data structure that can represent these operations. But oh, is, oh so your question is, can you do a traversal of? Um, <laughs> that's a good question. Uh, let's say that we really think there's, there's a very strong belief that our customers, some of them may be uh, uh, not trustworthy. Um, or also, we don't want to have a DOS attack where somebody might take a bunch of, just a picture of a bunch of unconnected rubber bands, send it to us, and shut it down. So, yeah, it should be able to handle a bunch of unconnected um, rubber bands. Yeah. OK, so start discussing possible ways you might do it. And the idea at this point, guys, Think of ideas. Think of different ways. You don't settle on, here's the one solution, but how might we approach this problem? <laughs> what? All we need is a data structure. Yeah, and you, uh, actually. We don't have to implement those string transformations. It's something that will support it. Right. <clears throat> OK, just to clarify, by the way, you guys, you just need a data structure that you could be feel comfortable. I'm going to have some of you guys come up here and hand wave your way through how you would implement these operations on it. You don't have to actually write the code, but it's got to be something plausible that people aren't going to throw shoes at you and say, no, you couldn't do it. That. That's not going to work. So yeah. What's the optimal group size here? Like six people too many? Uh, I don't know. Optimal group sizes. So the rule is, is if people are feeling excluded, move to a different group. If you're feeling like, you know, maybe, I don't know, self-moderate. Stick around. Oh, but, uh, yeah. just when came up to return my coffee mug, oh, it yeah. was so entertaining. <laughs> I had to sit and watch. Yeah. Of course, I had to drink a beer while I did it. Oh, well. Uh, <laughs> I think you got a <laughs> interesting <laughs> problem here, yeah. and you got a what a crowd. Yeah. Well, isn't this nice? Yeah, it is. More space, you know, yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. What? Yeah. We'll pack it. Yeah, we'll pack it. yeah well, I think we will. So. Oh, well, it was nice uh, seeing you, if only in passing. You and bet, you bet. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I just, you know, I got too much going on in my life. Yeah, I understand. To to every event. I understand. Yes. Take care. As long as there's any honey files. is good enough to actually get ordering correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You guys can assume the image recognition. <laughs> to clarify, you can assume that the image recognition is either good enough to 
um, correctly identify passing, crossings, over crossing, under, so the data coming into you is valid and good and that's going to be well behaved, or it's going to be the other team's fault, in which case you're still good. So. <laughs> Oh, oh. Is a crossing defined as only like a string over another string? Like what happens, like is that a three-way crossing? Oh. Or is that two two-way crossings that are just very, very that close is, together? That is three two-way crossings ah. that are very close together. And you could reduce it by doing that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and then well, you could do support, like, that. Right. You only have to support, right, one over one. <laughs> yeah. So I'm replacing the shortcomings of the previous structure with new shortcomings. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. But, try it out and but see what yeah. yeah. Well, it seems like people are getting engaged. Yeah. So. Uh, mm -hmm. More Ruby involved. Right? Yeah. 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 That was last time. I really felt like it. Just like uh, uh So at the season finale, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, it was all a dream. Uh, JGR, right. you know, whatever, <laughs> <Yeah>. something. <laughs> it's like. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, oh. Yeah. Are the off loads? What? Oh, yeah. There's no open strings. Yeah. Okay. So, with that, you can convert any shape with that property into any other shape with that property. Okay. Two, um, two other clarifications that people have asked. Um, one of them is, do we, can we assume that there's always just one crossing? Um, that there's not like things piled on the answer is yes. Um, so you don't have to worry about multiple crossings. These are the only ones they have to do. Let's assume that we send people a light field camera and ask them to retake it with depth if that's a problem or something. And the other question is, can we assume they're always closed loops? Yes. Let's say that if it turns out that, they, um, that if there's any loose ends, any singletons, um, that it's automatically determined, yeah, that's a defective rubber band, and we send them their fraction of a cent refund. Right. So, yeah. Are there only those three possible these are, the, these are the only operations your data type has to support. Okay. Okay. There's all sorts of other possibility things that can happen, but you just need to do these transformations. So how are we on content tonight? Should I, um, what should I target for I never emailed you, I meant to do that. I, I meant to ask you, but I've been. Um, so um, I was thinking like 30 to 40 minutes for you. Is okay, that? sure. Okay. okay. Yeah, because um, um, the other ones are about 45, about an hour worth of the other okay. content. Okay, so, yeah. okay. Okay, no. Yeah. Well, the third, what it is, is if you have, if you have this in the data structure, you're allowed to convert it to that. I see. Okay. So this in the data structure, they can say move this section across that juncture, oh, okay. like that. And you know you can do that with a rubber, right? If you got in a, it's a little hard to do that with a rubber band, but. Um, you can you see that you could do that with a rubber band and right. not have to cut the rubber band. This would just be tangled. Mm -hmm. um. Okay. Out the structure of the rubber band, or do we just need a data structure that enables us to solve the puzzle? 
So the data structure needs to represent all the crossings and their relationship to one another. Okay. So if you know what they are and then you do a transform, you need to know what the result is. Okay. Okay. But that mapping does not necessarily need to be, like we don't need to keep track of this segment connects to this intersection or whatever. We just need to know there are these intersections and then you go through the list and you make a transformation. Well, you, you would need to know where the ends go because otherwise you wouldn't know what the result was after you did them. So like if you have, um, if you have some block here with that, and then you replace it with that, yeah. you have some tangle here, you need to know what, how this hooks into that oh, so you could produce the result. I see. Okay. Um, yeah, the, an analogy would be um, a, a G subroutine to go through a find and replace uh, or to replace an occurrence of a regular expression in a string needs to not disrupt the rest of the string. It needs right. to keep the relationship to the rest of the string intact. Right. Um, so. Okay. You're trying to do something that can represent the data from the scanner and transform that data from these operations, and you're going to be called by the logic that tries to untangle it. So you don't have to figure out how to untangle it, you just need to update the state when it says, okay, switch this here and um, possibly raise exceptions if they try and do an illegal move. Um, Okay, you guys have had about 10 minutes to discuss. Does any group have, let's say, one idea per group that, um, I'm going to give you a minute after I ask the question to think about it, that you'd like to send somebody up and kind of talk through, hand wave through, how you would represent this object, how you'd represent this in Ruby. 
Um, okay, so talk amongst yourselves. If you think you've got one, pick somebody to go discuss it, and then when I, in about a minute, I'll ping you. Um, if nobody does, then I guess we'll do more time. But I think some of you are converging on, sounds like some pretty good ideas. So, okay? Okay, so bum ba da dum bum bum bum. Okay, if any, if your group has, if there's, if you've been designated by your group to explain a theory, uh, an idea, raise your hand. I see one. I see two. Um, three. Um, okay. So. Um, are you guys both going? Or are you guys different groups? Oh, okay. Um, okay. So, um, let's see. How about, uh, oh, how many people? Okay, everybody who's got your hands raised, come up and stand up here and queue up. Here's whiteboard markers at the top if you want. Oh, you can, no, they are. <laughs> Okay, so um, the other thing I'm going to say, if the person who is explaining the idea seems to be explaining essentially the same idea as your group had, come up and help them explain it rather than <laughs> waiting to explain it again. Okay, so go. So uh, we were looking at an example where you have, uh, let's see, this crossover. And uh, we decided that you have segments, intersections, and endpoints. And a segment has two endpoints. And an intersection can have um, more than two endpoints in it, essentially. And <coughs> if a segment has an endpoint that shares the intersection with its other endpoint, then that's the first step to eliminating this simple single loop situation. And then um, can, we didn't totally can I ask, are these things objects, like a segment is a class, an endpoint is a class, or are they um, fields of an object? Or what's, the, what's this look, sound, kind of, show us a little bit more Ruby. Object. Okay. Everything's an object, yeah. <laughs> True. Okay. Are these custom classes, or are they something like integers or you know fixed nums that just uh, you know identifiers? Um, depends. Some of them are custom, and some of them are not. Because the endpoint and segment situation is going to apply to all the different situations, and then there's going to be different rules about when you have an endpoint going to another intersection and the relationship to other. As far as my brain Okay. Um, any questions? Okay, next up. So we thought about this kind of starting from the point of view of you have a picture of this jumble of rubber bands. And we conceived it as being 
akin to a two-dimensional array, where the array is a map in the x, y, on, with the x and the y plane, and um, each cell in the array would represent either nothing, or it would represent one of these types of intersections, where you have something crossing like this, crossing like this, or crossing like this. And that's about as far as we got as far as modeling what this thing would look like. But I think that our team recognized that when there were no more, when you've applied the operations and there's no more intersections, you solve the problem. So that's, that's about as far as we've gotten to the problem. So one comment on that, um, if you guys understood that it's a grid, and things are either empty or they're an intersection. And I'm assuming you're forcing things to be grid aligned. So if it's an intersection, it's intersecting with the things you know, above, below, left, right. Um, that's actually very close to a technique that's used on this problem, except that they add a third dimension to allow you to route things around. Um, there's actually two ways of doing it. One is that the top and the bottom connect, but without causing intersection, or there's a third plane. Um, so, um, and actually, yes, by the way, people really do actually use computers to work on this problem. Um, uh, but it's kind of disguised here. Um, so the problem that with just doing it with just the XY thing is you can get to situations where this thing needs to connect to this thing, and there's no way to route it there without causing another collision that doesn't really, isn't really there. So, OK, any, anybody have any questions on that approach? OK. Um, next. All right. So our solution was fairly similar, but not quite uh, to the first one. Uh, so we had basically we modeled everything as two classes, intersections, and we didn't quite agree on a name for them: edges or connections. Um, so you have an intersection um, that that is a class, and it has two top edges and two bottom, two, two top connections, two bottom connections. Uh, and then we mostly sort of talked about how you can make judgments about the system of these things. So this, this is going to you know, connect to another intersection. Um, how you can make judgments about the system of those things to see whether you can apply one of the transformations. So if you have one of these things, any time you have an intersection in which one of the top edges and one of the bottom edges uh, are the same edge, you know you can apply the first transformation. Um, and any time you have two intersections which share a pair of edges and this top edge goes to the top edge and the bottom to the bottom, you can apply the second transformation. And we came up with a similar sounding rule for the third one that was slightly more complicated. <laughs> and what would you do if they tried to do it and you couldn't? They say, OK, flip this, and you can't. They say? Well, so the caller, right? So somebody calls in, because you've actually identified something nobody else has hit on yet, okay? which is that somebody could take this system here. Um, let's see if I can draw this correctly. Oops. OK, now this one here, this goes over and under, and this one goes over and under. So those things are hooked together. And they say, do Readmeister move number two on that. You can tell with your system, the way you described it, that they're trying to do that and... That they can't. Yeah. yeah we, we were talking more about how you determine if it was possible than what to do when someone says to do it. Right. So we, we the answer, question we answered was, they say, can I do this to these? And I say, no. Okay. <laughs> so that's, and there's actually, there's three, there's three canonical solutions. That is actually, I think, kind of my favorite, um, is that you ask, and you get back a Boolean result, you know, did that work or not? Uh, number two is you're just allowed to try it, and it throws an exception if, you know, uh, Readmeister 2 failure in whatever and gives you a stack trace. Um, or the third is it just quietly fails. Um, and of those, the returning the Boolean to tell them is probably, I think, the best. Does anybody have any more questions? Well, ours was similar. I would just add that instead okay. of <laughs> oh, well, that's totally different. That's a totally, yeah. <laughs> that, that you are maybe the other half of my group. Okay. <laughs> oh. <laughs> our, our group is not entirely actually. Okay. Okay. So, <laughs> what? There was some contention about that. Oh. <laughs> there wasn't even contention. We both, we just kind of used both interchangeably. So, which works great until you actually have to name your class. 
there's actually an interesting uh, sociology theorem, effectively. Um, the closer two ideologies are to being isomorphic, the more fervent the disagreement over minutia <laughs> will be. So if you have groups that are trying to kill each other, you can tell that their, their belief systems are almost completely isomorphic, except for whether you call it edge or segment, and those guys must die. Um, so, OK, next. Uh, ours was relatively similar to that, except that we had, uh, again, two models. One, for, we called it a crossing, but intersection can do. Uh, and then we had a model for the entire band. And the band has an array of crossings in it, and each crossing those uh, the upper band and the lower band of that crossing. Uh, aiming more, I, I mean, you would, once, you, once you have identified the thing and run through the algorithm, you will just have two kinds of objects. Um, and yeah, we were more just aiming for representing the, uh, the scenario, like strictly what should the data model be than what should the algorithm be. So we did kind of chat about that a little bit in uh, some ways of like how you would leverage it. Okay. Essentially, you would start at just some crossing at random, trace that band around to the end, uh, freshly doing the crossing to either top or bottom band uh, until you got back to the point you started at. Uh, and then you look to see, do I have any crossings? I haven't fully specified. Oh, I do. Uh, pick one at random, trace that one. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I think uh, with this approach that you and her and us and the first person took, I think just in the process of mapping out the rubber bands to create your data structure of what the rubber band is, you know immediately if there are more than one rubber band in the picture. You'd figure you out if there's more than one. You wouldn't figure out if they were knotted. because you'd say, hey, all of these segments are accounted for, yeah. and yet there is all this rubber band. Yeah. But and I know that these are all connected. Yeah, by the time you build the data structure, you would, oh. you would know how many bands. OK, any questions? OK, next. Well, they told us to refill our beers before all this. And I you know why it's so you could you know, laugh at me. But uh, as far as I could tell, um, we're really only looking for one situation where we have something like this and uh, from what I've heard at least the imaging software can, can take care of it if we have a, a picture like oh crap I can't draw it um, if we have a picture like this we're just looking for this situation because obviously our whatever machinery has malfunctioned and we've ended up crossing two rubber bands. So really, if you take a picture and you can tell, you know, I've got this crossing and I've got this crossing and they occur in a specific sequence, then you're experiencing a, a refund. So it's just, you know, no matter how many bands you tangle up, you're only looking for this one test case. And you know, if this ever occurs and the imaging software is good enough to tell, you know, give me a, a sequential order of these things and they happen right next to each other, you know, voila. The the problem with that is that if there's other bands, say, obscuring this, or if the bands are actually themselves knotted, um, so it turns out to be, this is, uh, I believe, NP complete. Like so this <laughs> kind of thing? Yeah, well, but all, also where if you say these two occur adjacent to each other, there could be arbitrary complexity in that zone there. Such of other, as? Other bands falling, yeah, other stuff happening. I mean, if this happens here, and I can tell this because of the software, then I know that this band is knotted around this band. Right. And oh. Wouldn't that mean that any time two bands cross, that one is being obscured? Like, you could cut one and have that look like they're joined in the behind, like, one, one in front? No. Sorry, it's not to. Yeah. Uh, you know? this, this is obvious. Right. And then you arrange it in such a way that the two ends meet behind. That's only one crossing. Huh. That's only 
one copy. Okay. We're looking for two in sequential order. Okay. That okay. happen next to each other. So say I'm going around this picture and I see this one and this one and they're both under, that's not a thing. If I go to like this one and this one, they're under over, that's a thing. And yeah. There, there's actually, there is a technique similar to that that's used as a simplification where they look for alternating over, under, over, under versus under, under right. um, and over, over. Um, but there are, it does get more complex than that. Um, and again, especially if you're talking with, with real rubber bands, probably not. But with these abstract things. Um, as far as rubber bands are concerned. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so let's, we're, let's keep it, more, I guess. Um, so thank you. And let's move. Do you not do? Actually, do we want to? Do you want to clean up some space? Uh, you want? Let's say oh. that these six things are all uh, subclasses of another class called Tangle, right? And the image recognition step of our pipeline hands us a bag of instances of Tangles, right? Um, we'll just go through the bag, just iterate through the bag of Tangles, and on each one we'll call a method called Untangle. And Untangle will try to replace itself uh, with um, a different tangle, right? So if you call Untangle on this guy, it will replace itself with this one, right? And all of each tangle knows which of its endpoints hook to the endpoints of the other tangle, right? Of course. So if you call this, it'll replace it with this. Simi similarly for these, these are simple, right? Um, but these Untangle methods also um, you know, for each subclass, they embed other logic so that if you have a class like this and it is hooked up to one like this, then we're done, right? If the cardinality is one, then we are successful. If it's more, then there must be more than one rubber band, right? Um, uh, this guy, you know, he can look for certain cases, like if he's hooked up to one like this, then they can replace the whole thing with one of these guys. Right? So you can just keep iterating over this, calling untangle, until you iterate over the entire set and there are no more possible changes, and then you lose, right? Or you reach one of these states. Um, you know, and there's like similar things that you could do that are more complicated. Like, um, you know, you can say that if one of these guys uh, hooks up like this, well, this, you know, you can see that that is just one of these. And so you can replace this guy with the two other Tangle instances. So you're just sort of iterating through, and hopefully each time you're making it a little bit simpler. And your endpoint is either you had no changes or you got to one of these instances here. So um, something like that could be made to work, but there's a problem here, OK? Um, and the problem is. If we get this structure here, this could be viewed as an occurrence of this pattern and an occurrence of this pattern. Or it could be viewed as an occurrence of this pattern and this pattern. Or this could th there's, there's multiple interpretations. And so what you wind up doing, and, and if, you, if you go in this, this is a, I, I've fallen down this, this hole myself. I, I, I know, I go, oh yeah, look, there's where I ripped my jacket the last time I fell down. If you find the constructor for your object doing all sorts of tests, and then, oh, maybe I should construct this other sort of object, and the constructor starts growing with lots of decision processes, um, uh, please grab my jacket, because it's stuck on a branch there. And, um, but yeah, so you see, do you see what I'm saying, though? That, that deciding which of these to do in a case like this from local information can become very difficult. Yeah, I wouldn't actually put it in the constructor. Um, I don't know if that makes okay, so not. where would you? Um, I would put it in a method called untangle. Right? Uh huh. So we, I assume that we receive these six things as primitives from the image recognition stage, right? Um, actually, what you receive? Well, oh, I'm sorry, that was probably my. What you receive is crossings. So you have to cons you have to decide. I was figuring your code would decide. Uh, okay. So yeah. So Any questions? Yeah. Or I'm still curious about the third possible operation and whether it is useful at all in the course of untangling, because it we seems to be entirely a no-op. We, we came up with its use. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm curious about 
Yeah, yeah, it's needed for completeness, but um, uh, actually, if anybody really wants the reality behind this, um, uh, not theory on Wikipedia. Um, but yeah. Why are we trying to refund our basis? We're not. <laughs> and. So, as always, Brent's called me on the actual thing. No rubber band company actually does this. Um, the people who do this are people like Galois, who are dealing with cryptography, and people who are doing bioinformatics, and uh, especially like uh, expression and uh, working with protein folding, and physicists. Um, because string theory actually hides down in there also. Um, and there's a lot of things about uh, manifolds. And um, so this actually gets done, and also gets done by pure mathematicians. Um, but, um, but who cares about them, right? So, so the, as far as like, protein folding goes, um, like they, they just gamified that because humans are better at abstract spatial reasoning than computers, at least thus far. And they, they solve like sequencing AIDS in like a couple weeks or something as opposed to like 10 years. Right, yeah, so there's an interesting thing that keeps happening with that. Um, Protein folding has the same pattern as AI, which is that people say, here's this problem, and it's really hard. And then somebody solves that problem. They say, hooray, it is solved. And then they go, well, yeah, but that's not really satisfying. Because we misstated the problem. Really, it's this other thing, and it's really hard. And then somebody solves that. Um, so on protein folding, uh, the initial thing was for designer things. They were saying, oh, but you can't tell from a sequence how to fold it, and how can we do designer stuff? And then somebody uh, came with a really good model where they said, um, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to look at, um, we are build a simple model of how the folding works, and then we're going to test to see how real um, amino acids obey our simple model, and we just don't use the ones that don't obey our model. There, we're done, OK? Because we're not evolution. We don't have to use all the palette. We can just use the ones that are well behaved. Um, and people go, yeah, but that's cheating, because we need to know how uh, certain like, uh, you know, mutations affect things. And we have to worry. Uh, um, and everybody goes, oh, well, we'll do this other way. And then they discovered um, prions and Crutchfield-Jacobs. And they're like, oh, wait, there's multiple answers. It's not a single valued function. And then they come up with a solution for that. And they say, OK, we need a way to do this like for the AIDS thing. Oh, well, we can have people do it. And we can crowdsource it, put it on Mechanical Turk and everything. And <coughs> surprisingly, there are still people trying to solve different versions of the problem because everybody has what we'd like is an oracle that'll tell us everything about a protein. Um, in, in the same way that cryptography sounds like it ought to be simple, and then you get into it, and it's, it's a morass. Um, and actually, string theory. Is it, all these problems have the behavior that it looks like it ought to be simple, um, and then you notice the bones and lost equipment and stuff, and you think, huh, <laughs> maybe the adventurers who go in here don't all come out, and it's harder than that. Um, one interesting model that nobody hit on that appears, oh, yeah. How you what? How you predict it to a sequence. Like right. We, we know the sequences of the proteins. We know what they look like. So we pick the The problem is, given an arbitrary sequence, how can you predict what it's going to be? And can you build a model that's going to tell you how that works in the speed at which it truly happens? Because entropy alone and what we know about the physics indicates what the entropy is going to be until the unknown And then you get weird things like um, there's uh, neutral mutations that should, should be just occurring naturally, ambiently, um, some of which don't occur. And the um, belief is that these don't occur because there's a transitional state that is, matches some enzyme that takes them apart. And that'd be a really interesting mechanism to know as a regulatory mechanism, because it's like we've got this shadow of um, uh, it's like having an alley that you see that people occasionally go down, and you believe people will wander down, but nobody ever comes out the other end. That might tell you there's something going on in that alley that you don't know about. 
but the absence of the data doesn't give you much to go on. So people try and model what would happen in the absence of actually of any information. Um, one of the models that people use to do this that I thought was really funny, really interesting, um, they take the um, crossings and they put them on a line. And then wherever they can, they just make things be hoops like this here. And where they can't, because that would involve crossings, they make hoops down here on another plane. And then they imagine three planes, and you can completely unravel it, and you have a sequence of crossings. And then you just have an array of those crossings that say what they go to, and the polarity of the direction that the things leave. Um, and that actually turns out to be a fairly efficient data structure, but it's a little bit mind-bending to see how you get there from the crossing diagram. Um, what? Um, multiple rubber bands, like I could have that would be one rubber band, and there, there's two rubber bands, just one laying inside the other. right? So it, it uh, abstracts over how many rubber bands there actually are. So at any rate, um, that was something that comes up in a lot of applications, some of which actually people mostly use Python, but you could do with Ruby um, for the people who are doing not dedicated hardware. Um, but it is decidedly not a Rails-flavored example, which is what I'm going for. So anyway, thank you guys all very much. And I think I went over time a little bit, but um, thanks.